I still practice medicine in my hometown, Westminster, South Carolina. I've been there almost 30 years, and I'm still the best doctor in town. Not a very high bar. I'm the only doctor in town, so I'm <laughs> the worst doctor in town, too. But all those years ago when I came into town, uh, I was young, and, and I was apprehensive that I would be accepted, and, and they would think of me as a doctor. So I was really delighted when this pillar of the community, a man known all my life, came to see me. And he died about a week later. Okay. And I was devastated. So I, I went to the hospital the next day and I was talking about what I could have done differently and how I could have treated him differently. And one of the crusty older doctors said, well, Billy, said, this guy came to see me about two months ago. And I thought it was for a new patient visit, but he was there to interview me to see if I would meet his very high standards for a primary care physician. And I was getting really irritated with all the questions. And so finally he said, he closes his little notebook and he takes his glasses off. He says, now, Doctor, the most important and last question here, what percentage of your patients die? He said, I leaned forward and I said, 100%, every damn one of them. <laughs> it's probably the last time I got cheered up by someone reminding me that we're all gonna die. Um, but it is true, we're all gonna die. And I think most of us hope that when we die, we'll make a difference, we'll have made a difference, and that we'll leave a legacy for future generations. And we spend a tremendous amount of money in this country on funerals memorializing the dead. Enough, in fact, that if you took a very small portion of that over the next 25 years, it would be more than enough to purchase, ecologically restore, and endow a million acres of high quality uh, wildlands close to where people live. Conservation burial grounds, which were pioneered here in the South, can help capture some of that potential income but they're way more than just greener versions of contemporary cemeteries. These are really significant natural areas where people can be buried. They're not cemeteries that, that accommodate a little bit of green. They're uh, more for the living than for the dead. They're specially designed uh, to be inviting places to, to hike, to have weddings, to bless babies, and just to have a good time while you're alive. But because Funerals and deaths really tap into our, our most closely held beliefs, hopes, and fears. There is an opportunity that funerals could change the way people think about not just that particular piece of land, but uh, the natural world in general. Because if our true great uh, goal is sustainability, then we're not talking about a million acres for 2,000 years. We're talking about 128 billion acres for a million years. That's the acreage of the planet. And to do that, it's going to take more than money. It's going to take, take a shift in culture. And I think conservation burial could be a tool in the toolkit to help move us towards sustainability. All right, we're going to quickly cover the demographics and economics of death, the nuts and bolts of conservation burial, and kind of the long-term consequences. As my friend the doctor pointed out, that's the most important demographic information, 100%, every damn one of us. But over the next 25 years, as we baby boomers become the death boomers, pleasant thought, <laughs> okay. Uh, we're gonna spend somewhere around a half a trillion dollars. Now that's a lot of money, I don't care what you say, it's still a lot of money. It's more than the combined wealth of the 10 richest people on the planet. But maybe another way of looking at it, more positively, is like 19 Bill and Melinda Gates foundations. So there's the potential there for a lot of good. And in fact, a small percentage of that would be more than enough to do what we want to do, to, to purchase a million acres uh, and, and restore it. Less than 5% would do that. 5% uh, could be a low number. The AARP did a survey of um, uh, planning for funerals, and they found that 20% of the people over the age of 50 would be interested or very interested in a green burial or a greener alternative to, to a contemporary burial, but the 50 to 55 year age class, that was, number was more like 50%. So I think you can say the market is there. Well, then how do we go from A to B and get the money into actually saving land? Well, 15 years ago, my wife Kimberly and I opened the first conservation burial ground in the world at Ramsey Creek in Westminster. Uh, we still have the offices to, together, so she's got her cemetery office in the doctor's office. I think we have the only combination doctor's cemetery office <laughs> in the country. So I can honestly say as a family practice doctor, I'm, I'm cradle to grave, I really am. <laughs> 
So what is it? What is it? Well, what it, what it is, uh, basically, conservation burial, you start with traditional natural burial. That's just no embalming, plain pine box, no vault. You can also use a shroud um, or just be buried in your street clothes. And the reason I say traditional, that's why Jewish people and Muslims are still buried, and we were all buried that way until quite recently. Um, the second part is to have those burials in a carefully selected, recovering natural area in a way that the burials themselves contribute to ecological restoration, keep a natural aesthetic, and accommodate all those other uses like the picnicking and hiking and everything else. And that's basically it. Cemeteries have protected nature for a very long time, but mostly by accident. Some of the best examples of tall grass prairie in the Midwest uh, are old cemeteries, and some of these are state nature preserves. Um, they were part of the inspiration for memorial ecosystems and, and conservation burial, because I figured if this could happen by accident, then what could we do by design? And that's exactly what we do. We take modern conservation science and restoration ecology to design and create spaces that are not in the best definition cemeteries. These are multidimensional social and ecological spaces I mean, where the burials don't overwhelm the naturalness of, of what is there. There are now six plus um, projects in the United States based on this, maybe as many as 12 because they're a bunch of about to open, there, and there's several around the world based on the Ramsey Creek model. Uh, there's actually a, a, um, a nonprofit, the Green Burial Council, that promulgates standards. Um, the quick, quick word about cremation. Um, we do take cremated remains. This is a cremation uh, uh, disposition in, at Ramsey Creek. But cremation is the second best thing you can do for the environment, really. It's a lot better than contemporary burial, where we, we bury 90,000 tons of steel, for example, in the ground every year. That's enough to, to build a Golden Gate Bridge out of. We put a million gallons of embalming fluid in the ground every year, eight, over 800,000 gallons. Um, so certainly cremation is a lot better than that. But the average cremation uses enough fossil fuel to propel a family car 4,800 miles. And it takes the life-sustaining nutrients in your body and turns them into air pollution. Now, again, that's still a lot better than contemporary, uh, and we, but, but keep in mind there are other alternatives. But this is, so I think we've got the market, and we've definitely got uh, the, a mechanism to capture the funding to save a million acres, but that's not the main point. Because it's not so much about saving the land as it is connecting human communities to the natural communities that we depend on and forging stronger bonds between those communities, bonds that could last for 2,000 years. Now, some people question both the need and significance of a million more acres of land. They point out we've got, uh, uh, I think, 2.3 billion acres in the United States, 650 million acres of public land, so why do we need any more? Well, you know, for one thing, it doesn't seem that public land has made a big difference in our land ethics. Um, it may be that we've got so much land that we figure you know, anything goes with the rest. We have a terrible sprawl problem, especially here in the South. Greenville's the fifth most sprawled out metro area in the country. We lost 700,000 acres of forest cover in this area and down at the I-85 corridor in, in, in the years between 1992 and 2010. That's how much as much land as we're talking about protecting. And part of the reason that I think maybe that public land has not made that impact on land ethics as much. A lot of it's way out there someplace. It's not close to us. A lot of it's inhospitable. Um, but I think maybe the bigger reason is that most of that land was protected for us decades ago by people long dead. Very few of us have actively participated in protecting a significant piece of land. We're just not that emotionally invested in it. It's a place where we can go out and have a good time and get resources, and there's nothing wrong with that. I do that too. But if that's all there is, it, it can really lead to problems. It is, it, okay, it's like the best vehicle in the world. It can, it'll, you can, it'll go anywhere. You can go down ravines. You can knock down small trees and haul pig manure in it. You don't have to worry about it. Anybody know what that is? Someone else's pickup truck. <laughs> You're just not that emotionally invested, okay? <laughs> okay, Martin Buber, I was a, a philosopher and theologian uh, in the early 20th century, and he called these types of use relationships I-it relationships as opposed to I-thou. With I-it, the other is just an object for our manipulation, exploitation, enjoyment, or experience. It's all about us. It's not about the other. 
Uh, that our relationships are true relationships, living relationships that understand the inherent value of the other. Most people think that Buber was talking about just people to people, but clearly in 1923 he was thinking else, uh, otherwise. He said, if will and grace are joined that as I contemplate a tree, I'm drawn into a relation, and the tree ceases to be an it, what I encounter is the tree itself. I think it's understanding that we belong to natural communities as much or more than they belong to us. And I think that if you have ceremonies like burials out in the, the wild, that it can, we can move more towards an I-thou relationship with the rest of the landscape. Frederick Turner, a cultural anthropologist who studied rituals, uh, basically he said that rituals like the burial of a loved one okay, can either shake your world up or it can reinforce your beliefs and attitudes. Most of us in our day-to-day -day world, we surf along, we don't have time or inclination to think about life, death, and our relationship with the natural world. But if someone dies, it, it really challenges us to consider deeper realities. Um, if you're alienated from nature, and your mama is pumped full of chemicals, put in a box in a box with pea gravel on the top and artificial flowers, that, that's not going to change your world. That's going to reinforce your alienation. On the other hand, if you're in a service in the woods where your mom is buried and she's becoming a part of that place, that could, that could really transform what you think about things. And that's what it's about. Aldo Leopold in his classic uh, Land County Almanac said that we need to move beyond in com our definition of, of community to include natural communities. But Bill Jordan, a restoration ecologist, said <coughs> A true community requires an exchange of gifts. And when you die and your body is buried there and, and your body's nutrients and what you are is becoming part of that other, that's a transubstantiation. That's a true gift. Um, and I think that if we can build these stronger bonds between human communities and natural communities, then we can leverage the million acres to a more sustainable planet. Now, can these bonds last for 2,000 years? Can it, can it really last? Well, it turns out there are sacred landscapes out there that have been around for more than 1,000 years around the world. My favorite places are, are the uh, Coptic, Christian Coptic churches in northern Ethiopia. Now, this is a Google Earth shot. It is not an anthill uh, <laughs> or, or crumbled Oreos. I think someone said that. In this, that's, that's a forest, and in the center of the forest, you see the church. There are 35,000 of these in northern Ethiopia. They're the last and best examples of Afro-Montane ecosystems in that uh, scorched place. Um, and, and it really does have most of the diversity there. The, the Coptic uh, Christians have been protecting these for 1,500 years. Okay, and, and it is places where people are married, where they're buried, and where children can come and watch wildlife. All right, so as I'm leaving today, my challenge to you is to think about what you want to have happen when you die. And whatever your decision is, whether it's to be buried in a natural way or to be cremated or whatever, just try to make it the best choice for you, your family, the broader community, and the planet. Thanks a lot.